Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, seminar. So uh, today, uh, this seminar is organized by uh, SAC, the Statistic Across Campuses Initiative, and the University of, uh, of New South Wales, sorry, um, and also uh, the Environmental Statistics section of the uh, Statistical Society of Australia. So today we have Erin Schlipp from the University of Missouri. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly, Erin. You got it. <laughs> Great. Erin um, uh, is assistant professor uh, in the Department of Statistics at the University of Missouri. She's also director of sports statistics. Her research interests are uh, in multivariate and spatial statistics, as well as Bayesian statistics and uh, she's also interested in environmental and ecological applications. So today, Erin will talk about Bayesian hierarchical modeling and data fusion for multivariate speciated nitrogen in lakes. Erin, the floor is yours. All right, perfect. Thanks, Boris. I appreciate it. So again, thanks again for the invitation uh, to come speak with many of you. I've seen, I definitely recognize the names on the list of participants, so it's definitely great to, to have you here. And so today I'm going to talk about an applied project that I've been working on really over the past sort of, I guess, stems from the past four years, but it's uh, really just come into fruition here in the past um, six to eight months or so. And as, as Boris was mentioning, it's with uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling and data fusion for multivariate speciated nitrogen in lakes. And so this work stems from a project that got started about a little over four years ago. Uh, this picture shows a team uh, that we refer to ourselves as a continental limnology team. It was part of a big five-year NSF macrosystems uh, biology grant. And if you scan through, you may or may not recognize some of the folks in this picture. I'd assume probably not, as this is a group of primarily limnologists um, across the United States. And so there's a couple, I think there's three or four statisticians in this group and about three or four um, computer scientists in this group. And so again, it's a very interdisciplinary group of researchers. And one of the main goals of this project has been to try to understand and predict uh, nutrient patterns in all, so capital all there, meaning all continental U.S. lakes. And so in order to do this, this project has really been broken down into a, a couple different sort of sub-components or sub-phases. And so some, the first component is more of a data collection um, component, and then the second part is more of a statistical and uh, computer science modeling perspective. And so the... As I mentioned, the, sort of the first goal of this project has been to produce more or less a database. And so the database that we've been working on over the past um, approximately four years is called LOGOS, but stands for Lake Multiscale Geospatial and Temporal Database. And what this database does is it includes measurements of things that pertain to lakes. And so um, primarily we have measurements of nutrients and water quality metrics um, collected across about tens of thousands of lakes. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about these particular measures here in a little bit. Um, and then we have ecological data that's derived from, or that's obtained from either GIS or remote sensing that captures um, information for somewhere on the order of 170, I believe, 170,000 lakes across the continental US. And so this has been a major undertaking. In fact, this project was sort of the second phase of a, of a, five, a second five year grant to pull this data together because it's really taken um, data sources from, I think, roughly 87 different federal, state, universities, tribal, um, citizen science, different agencies that have gone about and collected this data. It's been a, the compilation of all of these different data sources in order to pull together this big uh, data product. And so the first phase uh, pertains to lake data from the, the Midwest and Northeast, so about a 17 state region across the United States. And then the second phase of this project has been to uh, expand west and slightly south to capture lakes across the entire continent of the United States. And so, again, the first phase of this project is to be devel developing this data product, um, and we're very, very close to having it completed. Excuse me, motorcycle. Uh, and now the second phase, and we've sort of been doing this along, um, along the, the, the way as we've been developing the database, is also to develop new approaches to better understand uh, the spatial and temporal patterns um, in lakes and to try to reduce uncertainty when we're trying to predict stay at unobserved locations. And so you can imagine, as I just mentioned, in terms of the data product, um, tens of thousands of lakes, 
does not nearly capture the number of lakes across the United States. Um, and hundreds of thousands of lakes does not nearly capture the number of lakes across the United States. So there's still a lot of locations um, where we don't have data collected. Um, and so whether it, whether it doesn't exist or whether it does exist, but we weren't able to get our hands on it, um, sort of just two, two places where we wouldn't have particular data that we're interested in um, having. And so prediction is, is one of the big components of that. And so the sort of the first phase of this data collection um, process has dealt with this, what we call Lagos Northeast. And so this data product or data site consists of 51,000 lakes and reservoirs that are greater than four hectares. And it's a 17 state region in the sort of Midwest and Northeast. And I'll show you a map here in a second of the area that I'm particularly talking about. What this database includes is, is really three different data modules. And so we have the lake location and some physical characteristics about the lake. So it'd be like lake area, lake depth. Um, we have some ecological context pertaining to the lake. So this is what's happening near or around the lake. And so you can imagine land use measures from a particular watershed or the area surrounding the lake. And different geologic information about, say, connectivity of these lakes based on uh, maybe stream systems or underground stream systems. We have climate variables or climate climatic information. Again, this could vary across obviously space and through time and then some, some additional information about the hydrologic setting of these lakes. So again, how, how much is runoff, for example, impacting these particular lakes, or what is the under, under, um, underlying flow of the water in this particular region? And so again, physical characteristics, ecological characteristics, and then the measurements of lake water quality are the, some of the measures that we're most uh, closely interested in uh, because of some of the impacts that they have on the, the the ecology of the region. Again, this could be in terms of the fish species or the algae that's, that's growing there or the, the sort of human impact. And again, a lot of these lakes, especially say in you know, the states like Minnesota are used for recreational purposes. And so we want these, the water quality in these lakes to be good. And so some of the, the nutrients that are often um, recorded are nitrogen or phosphorus. We have chlorophyll and then this measure of what's called secchi depth, which is a, a measure of uh, water clarity. So how far into the lake can you see um, some sort of black and white disk as it goes down. So the data that's been collected that, that comprises this Lagos Northeast consists of approximately uh, three decades worth of, of, of data. Again, some lakes are sampled much more often than others. Some lakes must, might have been sampled recently. Some lakes might not have been sampled since, say, the late 80s or early 90s. And so as I mentioned before, this, this is really the compilation of 87 data sets, uh, different ways that the data has been collected different locations in which they've been collected, um, and again, for, for lots of different purposes. And so if you're interested in looking at this data, it's publicly available. There's R packages and things that can help you load it in and sort of investigate all these different variables. So here's a link, but again, feel free to, to shoot me a message and I can get you connected to where these, these data are located. And so most of the, the work that's been focused on nutrients in lakes has been focused on phosphorus. And so it's because this sort of has a really important control on some of the primary production that happens in lake. But most recently, there's been a few studies that have come out focusing on the sort of the importance of the critical uh, role of nitrogen in lakes in terms of shaping the ecosystem function and the water quality in these particular lakes that we've been looking at. And so importantly, when we start thinking about nitrogen, uh, I take a note here that I knew nothing about lake nitrogen before I started working on this project and now I feel like I know sort of enough to be dangerous. But, but both the amount and the form in which nitrogen occurs is important. And so we can have different components of nitrogen, say inorganic versus organic nitrogen. And depending on the varying levels of these components, um, we can get some, some sort of negative impacts, such as say toxin formal algal blooms. So when you have warm temperatures and high nitrogen concentrations, uh, some of this, this toxin forming type of, of algal blooms do in fact exist. So depending on the, the landscape characteristics of the area around the lakes, you can have different influence on the, say, the delivery of nitrogen that moves from the land through the lake ecosystem. And again, this is going to vary quite dramatically across um, the landscape, again, across northern lakes to southern lakes, depending on, say, where there's agricultural lands um, is sort of one of the big drivers of nitrogen, um, again, purely based on uh, the runoff from, say, the fields and fertilizers that are used. And so here's just a brief uh, map of the percent agriculture land around the lakes. And so here's roughly, I think, 2,300 lakes that have uh, lake nutrient or nitrogen concentrations that have been measured across this Lagos Northeast region. And so again, this is the Northeast part of uh, the United States, Minnesota, 
Iowa, Missouri. So I'm like right here and then up through um, the, the northeast of Pennsylvania, New York, uh, up through the, the tip of Maine. And so just a couple important things to, to mention here is that you can definitely see the scaling from white to, to, to black here on the, the coloring for agriculture, recognizing that agriculture lands uh, tend to be pretty common here in sort of this, this Midwest region of southern Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and southern Michigan. And you see in the, the much northern regions of northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, the upper peninsula of Michigan, and up through the sort of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine region, you see much less agriculture lands. Again, these are regions that are much cooler, colder in temperature than some of that uh, more uh, lower latitude locations. So again, quite a bit of variation for this particular measure, but here just sort of gives you the, the scope of what these, these uh, lake locations look like. Again, these are the ones that are observed. This is not nearly representative of the lakes across this particular 17 state region. Uh, similarly, here's a, here's a map of just the maximum lake depth for all of these same set of lakes. You can see much less spatial structure in these types of, of, of variables. Uh, I would have expected before working on this project that lakes that are nearby each other tend to be of similar uh, depth. Turns out that's very much not true. Uh, you can have very shallow lakes next to, next to very deep lakes um, in very close proximity. And so uh, trying to capture the variation across um, this region is definitely not so much of a spatial process as you might expect um, that we saw with the agriculture. But again, these are important variables when we start thinking about nitrogen in these particular lakes and sort of the, the impact of the surrounding area on those particular lakes is, is one of the things that's particularly important. And so understanding the sources in cycling is what we refer to it as cycling of nitrogen is uh, imperative for coming up with ways to characterize these lakes and also to try to manage the lake water quality. Um, however, trying to do this is challenged by a lot of different factors. And so total nitrogen, which again is exactly as it sounds, is the total amount of nitrogen um, in the lake, can be broken down into different subcomponents. So again, I mentioned earlier the organic versus inorganic, but it can also be broken down into, say, dissolved versus particulate nitrogen. And all these different sort of subcomponents of nitrogen might have different environmental drivers. So what environment sort of produces high organic nitrogen might not produce high inorganic nitrogen. And so, interestingly enough, all of the work that's been done in trying to model total nitrogen as a function of, say, environmental uh, or climate variables has not focused on these subcomponents. And so uh, that's one of the pieces that we'll be incorporating into our model here today. Another sort of challenge that comes to play when we start looking at total nitrogen is that the methods for which total nitrogen is um, reported um, is different and it can have varying detection limits. And so depending on what type of technology you're using to measure the different concentrations of nitrogen, you might not um, be able to actually observe values that are, are say below some threshold. And so that's not to say that those observations are not important. There's still usually information in them, um, but, but you can't really uh, take them for what they are if, if, if the individual, for example, just reports the lower detection limit of their device as opposed to an actual value that we think is in that particular lake. Uh, a couple different, um, a couple further issues of, of modeling lake nitrogen. Uh, there's dramatic variation in the nutrient levels of, among the lakes and across this particular region. And so we really want to be able to look at them across this macro scale in order to really understand the different drivers um, across these gradients in terms of climate and environment. And also, as I mentioned earlier, is that the number of observations across the lake uh, vary. And so where some lakes might be observed once, and it might have been only once back in the early 90s, some lakes have been sampled, say, hundreds of times, in which case we want to be able to leverage the information that we have. And so coming up with a way to, to account for these, what you could refer to them as some sort of um, replicate observation, is definitely an important component of this type of modeling. And so I'd say the biggest hurdle that we, we were tasked with when we started learning about total nitrogen um, and from the modeling perspective is that total nitrogen is actually the sum of these different components. And so you can actually write total nitrogen as the sum, uh, as the sum of components, which referred to as total Keldahl nitrogen, or TKN, and nitrate nitrite. So TKN plus NO2, NO3 is actually equal to TN. And so if that's not enough, TKN, the total Keldahl nitrogen, is actually broken up into ammonia, NH4, and organic nitrogen, which I've denoted as ON. And so you might say, okay, you're getting a little bit too far into the weeds here, but actually this is critical 
uh, to understand because all of those, say, 2,300 lakes that I just showed you in that map, they don't all report total nitrogen in the same way. So it turns out that some locations actually directly measure TN, and then other um, lakes and other labs that are doing the sampling derive TN as the sum of total Keldal and nitrate nitrite. And so depending on what approach is being used, uh, you, you, you're still getting a measure of total nitrogen, but you can imagine it from like say even a measurement error perspective, things are definitely different. And so what do we do? How do we account for this? Um, is is de definitely one of the, the biggest challenges that we started looking at. And so you can might say, okay, well, just include different measurement errors. That's that's fine. But but one of the things and why this is particularly important is that in some locations where you observe both total nitrogen and then some of these subcomponents, you can get situations where in this particular lake, which is number two 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 two, which doesn't necessarily matter, but what you see here is that when this lake was observed, total nitrogen was observed at 10 micrograms per liter, whereas nitrate nitrate was observed at um, 0.11 micrograms per liter. So you can imagine here, this total nitrogen is the sum of nitrate nitrate plus some other things. And if the observe, observation of nitrate nitrate is greater, greater than total nitrogen, then there's definitely some inconsistencies here with how the data um, were observed in the measurement area that's being collected. And so it's our job to try to think about how we can do better. And so here's a little another picture now going back to those same locations. And so what I've plotted here is not only the amount, this is again the median observed value of total nitrogen across the region, but also the shape, so whether it's a circle or triangle, denotes whether or not the TN was measured directly or whether it was calculated by its measures of its subcomponents. And so what you see, so not only do you see some, some major differences in the colors where we see sort of the, these darker values here more towards the middle and then lighter values in the north um, and in the northeast, we also see uh, some regional bias towards calculated versus um, measured nitrogen across the region. Where there's much more circles up here in the northeast, much more triangles here, particularly in Michigan and southern Minnesota. And so you can imagine if you don't account for these differences and say you just model the measured version or the calculated versions, you're definitely going to have some bias in the type of inference that you're going to be drawing. And so to take that a step further, we could say, well, if you develop models, say, from either TN measured or TN calculated, you're definitely going to have a rough time making predictions out of sample. You're definitely going to be doing some spatial extrapolation into some novel environments. Um, if you have no uh, measures of one type, say, in Iowa, then if you want to predict in Iowa, how, how do you know you're really accounting for that entire environmental grade if you wanted to make predictions at? So that'd be step, sort of problem number one. Uh, problem number two is if you develop just one model and ignore which um, way TN was reported, whether, whether being measured or calculated, you're not going to account for the differences in measurement error, and you're not going to be able to detect the differences in some of the environmental drivers for the different species of nitrogen. Right, so what our goal here, and hopefully I've now motivated it enough um, for you to be interested, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage both method, methods of reporting and all of these subspecies that are observed in order to try to improve our prediction and improve our inference um, for lake nitrogen across the entire region. And so from the modeling that we're going to do, I'm going to go through sort of the, the main components and then talk about it in a little bit more detail. We're going to develop a statistical data fusion model for total nitrogen that addresses, again, these following challenges. We're going to have multiple methods for obtaining measures of TN and all of its subspecies that are observed. So that's uh, component one. The second thing we want to want to want to incorporate is the fact that we have lower detection limits for the different species of nitrogen, and these are going to vary both by species and by location, depending on what lab is doing the collection. So depending on what technology they're using to do their their collection and to do their measuring, um, there are different lower detection limits on those particular devices that we want to be able to leverage um, in our estimates. Um, there's definitely variability with that. It, where there's variability in the measurement error across the different species of nitrogen. And so is there information that we can leverage to try to understand what that type of measurement error is? Um, and again, depending on the devices that are being used, this could definitely vary not only just by species, but also by, by lab that's doing the collection. And so again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of the, the model development. And the last thing, as I mentioned earlier, is we want to be able to incorporate the replicate observations. And so if we observe places more than once, we definitely want to use that information um, 
to our benefit to try to hopefully increase um, our precision in our estimates. And so just to break this down a little bit further, here are the different observables that are shown in red um, that can be obtained for speciated nitrogen. And so you can directly measure TN. You can directly measure total keldal nitrogen, or TKN. You can directly measure nitrate nitrite, the NO2, NO3. And you can directly measure ammonia. And so from those four components, you can see how these different pieces align. But as I mentioned earlier, TKN can actually be written as a component of dissolved organic and particulate nitrogen, which I've denoted as DOPN and NH4. Again, this looks like a chemistry lesson here, but TN, total nitrogen, can be written as either TKN plus NO2, NO3, or it's three subcomponents of DOPN, NH4, and NO2, NO3. And so the one thing you can recognize is, so if there are four, the top four here, these four items, those are the four possible observables for a particular replicate observation for a lake. You notice that these four things can actually be computed from a linear combination of DOPN, NH4, and NO2, NO3. And those things are particularly distinct. And so what we're going to do here in order to develop a model that leverages the information across these different observables is we're going to develop a model for these three subcomponents that are distinct and then try to map them to the, the observables um, for each particular lake. And so think about a joint statistical model for those three subcomponents. And so now, again, we can stop thinking so much right about the, the nitrogen and think, think more about the modeling perspective here to start. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to jointly model DOPN, NH4, and NO2, NO3 across the region. And so we model these jointly, uh, knowing that there's, there's, there's possible and likely some dependence across these particular, these particular subspecies. We model them on the log scale here to, to ensure that we have non-negative values. And so if I let y sub i equal my, my log of these values, DOPN, NH4, and NO2, NO3, I can write this just sort of a traditional joint species distribution model at the sort of process level um, for these particular three variables. And so here log of y sub i is a multivariate normal, which is written as a mean term, which is a beta matrix times an xi uh, vector of covariates and then a sigma matrix, which is capturing any of the uh, remaining dependence that's not captured by the covariates in that particular lake. And so the important thing about this is that by having this, this, um, this B matrix, we can capture any of the effects of those environmental covariates, Xi, that might differ for these different subspecies. So again, if agriculture land tends to be um, positively related or tends to increase NO2 and NO3 but decrease NH4, we can learn that from the model. Okay, so that's, that's an inference that you would not be able to obtain from a, um, a purely uh, univariate model for uh, total nitrogen. And so we can sort of treat these sort of log y's, or the y's themselves, as the true latent values um, for these lake nitrogen species. And then what we're going to want to do is we're going to specify a data model um, conditional on these in order to map them to what our possible observables are. And so you can let, here just following a little bit of notation, we can let our z i r here denote a vector of observables for lake i and for replicate r. And so r could be a replicate, any number, it could be 1, it could be 10, depending on the particular lake and how many replications or replicate observations it had. And so this is the vector of, of the four observables that you might have for that particular lake. And so you notice that we can map those three um, y's to the vector of z's by defining this matrix M. And so if I'm going to let my eta sub i here for a particular lake i be the vector of, say, true values for those measurable variables for lake i, then we can define our etas as M times y. Right? So you can imagine eta 1 here is total nitrogen. It's the sum of all three y components. Eta 2 is TKN. That's the sum of the first two y components. Eta 3 is a direct measure of NH4, and then eta 4 is a direct measure of NO2, NO3. And so this M matrix is just a way of mapping these Ys to what is our observables. And so from that point on, that's like the, the, the sort of the meat and potatoes of this type of a model where we just specified a, a data model that incorporates these different subspecies and in the information that we can leverage across all of them to try to actually learn the Ys, again, the true values for those subspecies that are distinct. And so if you were to write this down as a traditional, say, measurement error model, you'd say, okay, well, I can just write this down with Z, I, R, J, so that's just the J element of that vector, is equal to the true value A to I, J plus some measurement error, right? It's just a pure measurement error model. 
And you might say that the epsilons here are are conditionally independent given the true value of the etas. And so you could say, oh, let's just model them, let's say a normal error model with some variance, call it tau squared. And that's going to be presumably uh, species specific. And so the measurement error might vary, say it's a function of whether it's TN or whether you're observing TKN or NO, NO2, NO3 or whatever. And so that's sort of a good starting point. And so you might say, okay, go pull the trigger and run this model and see what happens. And that's almost what we wanted to do. Um, but the one thing that we've sort of been forgetting here is that we have issues of detection limits. And we actually have a couple other issues which we've learned about in terms of measurement error uh, that we wanted to really incorporate to extend this model a, a little bit further. And so our analysis had to really incorporate these sort of three additional modifications. This is definitely specific to this data set in particular, in this analysis in particular, um, but sort of what made this project sort of you know. And so we had some auxiliary data and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, that helped us to learn about the error terms. And so the first thing we learned is that they're multiplicative rather than additive. And so we don't see measurement error just being a pure measurement error. We, we, we see it being something that scales with, with the quantity. And so we see larger errors when the nitrogen concentration is higher than when the nitrogen concentration is low, lower. And so to, to sort of account for this, we model our observables on the log scale so that we have that multiplicative scaling of, of the error. The second thing we learned from our exploratory data analysis is that these errors are actually not normally distributed. They actually have pretty extreme heavy tails. And so we specified a T distribution as instead of a, um, a normal distribution to try to capture the heavier tails. And so again, they're still gonna be species specific, but they're gonna allow there to be some, some pretty high values of measurement error in some scenarios or some locations. Uh, the last thing, again, we mentioned this earlier is that we want to be able to have detection limits that are accounted for. And so we don't want to just throw out observations that don't um, have detections that are above their limits, but we want to be able to still learn from it. So even though we don't maybe know the exact value that's somewhere between, say, zero and the detection limit, we want to say, well, at least we know it's in that region or we observed that it was in that region. And so can we leverage that, part, that particular information a little bit in, in developing our model? And so in order to, to do this, we have to know what the detection limits are. And unfortunately, that group of, of collaborators that I showed you on slide number two showed you a picture of about 30 limnologists that, that helped us do this. And so they were able to identify the detection limit for each species, for each lake, for each replicate. So they are able to dig into the data, figure out who was doing what, where it was being collected, how it was being collected, to determine what the particular detection limits are for each species that was observed. And so this is going to help us to actually be able to incorporate these into our model. And so here, let my L sub I R J, my detection limit for that lake, for that species, and for that replicate. Again, these could be consistent across replicate, replicate but they don't necessarily have to if some lab got some new technology when it went through and, and was doing its um, collection. And so it was it's sort of hard to get this last piece uh, sorted out because it wasn't always obvious to determine which lakes were falling below this detection limit because all um, labs that were doing the reporting sort of reported different values when it was below the detection limit. So some put in a zero, some put in the value of the detection limit, some picked just a value arbitrarily between the lower limit and the detection limit, say half the detection limit, and you see sort of all of these in the data set. And so again, if you go through and, and you start playing with this data yourself, you'll definitely notice this. You'll see a big spike of a ton of observations with 25 micrograms per liter. Um, and it clearly it's because that was the detec detection limit for that particular location. And so we, we generalize our, our normal error term to a three parameter location scale family for our T distribution, where instead of having just a mean zero and a variance that was tau squared, now we have a scale parameter and a degrees of freedom parameter. And these can be specified with sub J on them to denote that they're, they're um, species specific. Again, we don't let the measurement error vary across um, location, and we don't let it vary across uh, replicate, but it is definitely species specific. And so we utilize our auxiliary uh, data to help actually specify what these particular measurement error components are. Because uh, without that, um, we have a really hard time of sort of tying down what, what is what in this particular setting. And so this is what the model actually looks like. And so if you've ever fit, say, a Tobit regression model, it sort of has the same sort of flair. What we see is we just incorporate an indicator variable um, for in the model to determine whether or not that value is above the detection limit or below the detection limit. 
And so all it's really doing is it's, it's giving probability mass to the values below the detection limit, and then it's using that T distribution, um, or the, the density of the T distribution, to model the values that are above the detection limit. And so that's what's going on here is we have the, the PDF here of the T distribution when the value of Z is above the detection limit, and then you have probability mass assigned for values using the same T distribution for values of Z that are, that are um, in this case, one minus indicator, so below the detection limit. And so that's going to help us, again, leverage that we have multiple observations, we've got replicate observations, we've got multiple species, and we've got some that are falling below the detection limit, but they all could possibly be informative. And so a couple of just important facets of this model in particular is that we want to leverage the information across all of these different things that I just mentioned. And so unless you observe your data without measurement error, um, the TN is really never going to equal exactly the sum of its observed components. And so somehow we want to be able to still use those subspecies to inform on our total nitrogen estimate, estimates. And so each of those observables is still contributing in some way to the estimate of true TN. Um, species that are observed, say, with higher precision should be more influential in estimating TN versus those that are, that are observed um, much, or that are much more difficult to observe. And so we actually were able to use some a priori scientific information to actually specify what these measurement error distributions were for these four different observable species. And so that was really sort of the, the important piece that we were able to, to include in this model to actually do the inference that we wanted to do. And so data from the USGS and also from the North Temperate Lakes Long-Term Ecological Research Network, or LTER, if you've heard that acronym before, were able to help us specify what these measurement error variances were. And so what the, these programs do is they collect water samples from different lakes, and then they send it out to a bunch of labs. In this case, I think we looked at information from 86 different water chemistry labs. Each lab is responsible for measuring the subcomponents of the species, and then they send them back in, and they try to then use that to determine what is the measurement error for this particular um, water sample. And so sort of the weird component is that there is no known true value but there is some sort of measure of what's the most probable value. And so they can take these 86 observations and come up with some sort of most probable value and then look at the, the variation around that most probable value. And that's what we did to try to understand then what is the measurement error for these different components. And so we used some of the samples that they, that they sent out to their different labs that spanned the range of the data in Lagos. And that's how we were able to then inform what those scaling parameters and what those degrees of freedom parameters were for a measurement error, very, uh, measurement error uh, distributions using the T distribution. And so just a, a couple of brief details as we fit the model in a Bayesian framework, we assign prior distributions to our, our model parameters, except for those measurement error variances, um, the scale and the degrees of freedom were fixed using the auxiliary data information. Uh, we, I wrote up a, a hybrid metropolis within Gibbs sampling algorithm to try to sample from the joint posterior. And the, the, the inference that we're interested in looking at is the full posterior distributions of our Ys. And then if we have, if we use composition sampling, we can then get full posterior distributions of total nitrogen by looking at the summation of, of each of the Y components. And so, so that's sort of what we were looking at and what we were interested in looking at. And so the data that we actually used to um, fit this model was 2,300 lakes across that 17 state region, which is that picture that I showed earlier. Um, and we focused in on just the months of July, August, and September, um, noting that in particularly some of these northern states, um, it, the lakes themselves freeze. Um, and so if there's freezing or semi-freezing conditions, uh, the nitrogen is, is um, not usually observed. And so focusing on these sort of late summer months, you're, you're capturing um, more of the summer seasonality that you might see for nitrogen um, for this particular window. And so instead of including all observations across this window, we recognize that there's likely some temporal variation, um, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, but we only included um, um, observations that were, that were taken within the five years of the most recent observation. And so there still could have been 100 some observations for a particular lake. But if we had, say, 100 observations, then we weren't interested in going back to 1980 when that lake was first sampled. Then we weren't trying to look for any sort of temporal gradient in, in lake nitrogen in this particular analysis. And so of this, just to give you a little bit of detail about the, the data that we, that we actually had here, is that all of these lakes had observations of NO2, NO3, and NH4. Um, 1,600 of them had only one observation, 
and 338 had two, um, which means there's some number, roughly 300 or so, that had more than two replicates. And so the maximum number of replicates was 149. You can imagine that some of these locations of lakes that are close to city centers um, actually get sampled much more often. Uh, some lakes never had direct measurements of TN and therefore always reported calculated, meaning the sum of its components, whereas some lakes never had measurements of TKN and always reported measured TN. And so, again, the number of observables for a particular lake um, vary quite dramatically across uh, the spatial region. Some replicates even had measurements of both types, and so that was sort of the, the best case scenario is because then you have the measurements of all of the different subspecies to be able to leverage to estimate nitrogen. Um, in terms of where the replicates are most common, um, you, you'd hope that it's random, but it's definitely not. Turns out that of the 745 lakes that had one or more observation of measured TN, 27% of them had five or more replicates. And so you see much more replicates here where TN was measured, whereas of the other lakes that, the 1,500, or, yeah, 1500 lakes that had calculated TN, only um, about 4% of them had five or more replicates. So much fewer replicates in that sort of um, method of reporting. All right, so just a little bit of detail here. Again, I think I'm going to skip through this a little bit just in lieu of time. Um, but the, just the number of observations of the different subspecies is, is variable across the species. The number that falls below the detection limit is quite variable. You see much more observations below the detection limit for NH4 and NO2 and NO3 than you do for TN or TKN. And then the detection limits also vary quite a bit um, depending on what species uh, is being um, observed. And also these are assumed known based on the labs that are doing, the, the doing the sampling. And so again, we relied on our, our collaborators to help us sort that part out. And so a couple of the environmental variables that we're interested in looking at, we had both region specific, so that's based on the, the watershed and the area around the lake. And then we had some lake specific covariates so that's based on purely like the area, maximum depth, um, the size of the lake relative to the watershed around it and then measures of connectivity. So you can imagine if you're a isolated lake or you're a headwater, you're not going to have other lakes and streams running into it. And so you can imagine that could be pretty nice in terms of a water quality um, for that particular region. <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to go to northern Minnesota and you can see where the Mississippi River starts in, um, at Lake Itasca, so Itasca State Park, um, you can see exactly where that spring is coming up and where that river, which as it gets down into the Gulf, right, you can see it's a huge river. It flows through the state of Missouri as well. Um, you can see the water up there is very different than the water that you see running through the river here, and that's hitting the ocean uh, down to the south. And so again, if we're interested in, in water quality, you might definitely see some, some differences depending on the connectivity of these different lakes. And so we don't need to get buggy out here looking at these different numbers. Um, for the coefficients for the, the parameters, um, the coefficient estimates for the different species of nitrogen. But the important thing to look at, so again, the columns here denote the different subspecies of nitrogen that were being modeled, and the covariates are along the rows. So it's shown in bold are significant um, based on the 95% credible interval for those different parameters. And the, the things that are in particular important are these ones that I've denoted with little stars. You got a star runoff and a star. Uh, nitrogen deposition, you got star max depth. The reason that those are starred is that the coefficient for that, um, for that variable had differing signs depending on what subspecies you were looking at. And so for example, runoff, which is measuring the sort of the impact of what's happening as water is running off the land surrounding the lakes, has a negative sign here for uh, dissolved organic and particulate nitrogen versus, and a negative sign for ammonia, but it has a positive sign here for NO2 and NO3. And so again, we know that fertilizer in particular um, increases nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite in particular lakes. And so we're able to detect, detect these differences. So if you were only modeling total nitrogen, you would never be able to look at how are these different environmental conditions actually impacting um, the subspecies of nitrogen. Um, and, and, and you'd be able to detect these differences. And so we have sort of what I say three variables here that had uh, significant different um, signs. So saying increasing and decreasing depending on the different subspecies. And so this was particularly useful um, for our collaborators as we're thinking about sort of land use and land use changes across the, across the region. Uh, we can look at the residual dependence between these particular species. And we notice sort of the, the most important thing is that we, we, there is residual dependence uh, still between dissolved organic and particulate nitrogen and NH4 and uh, significant um, dependence 
are positive dependence between NH4 and NO2 and NO3. Um, the, the magnitude of the diagonal here of this covariance is also uh, interesting that we see in terms of the amount of variation in that particular species that sort of isn't being accounted for by the, by the covariates is quite, is like an order of magnitude bigger for NH4 and NO2 and NO3 relative to DOPN. And so we, from the model, instead of just looking at, say, the median observed value across the region, across the whole time period, we can now get full posterior mean estimates and posterior standard deviation estimates for the particular region. And so you see, again, some of these similar patterns that we might have seen. Uh, but now we, we know that these estimates were obtained by incorporating all the different observations, we're incorporating all the different measurement errors, and we're incorporating those detection limits um, in a more formal probabilistic framework. And so again, we can get the mean estimates as well as our, our standard deviation of the estimates here. And for the most part, you see that as the means um, increase, your, your estimates of uncertainty also increase. Um, and that's, I guess, not surprising based on, on, on what we knew from the exploratory data analysis as well. So one other piece of sort of important inference here, and then we'll start wrapping up with some conclusions, is looking at what is referred to as dissolved orga inorganic nitrogen. And so this is what I mentioned earlier in, the, in my talk about those um, toxin, uh, those algal blooms that I was mentioning when the nitrogen concentration is high and the temperatures are high. And so dissolved inorganic nitrogen can be computed as NH4 plus NO2 NO3 over total nitrogen. And again, this is a map you would never be able to get if you were modeling total nitrogen. And so what we're able to see in this particular picture is um, the variation in the percentage of dissolved inorganic nitrogen as a function of total nitrogen. And so it definitely varies across the landscape. Um, and depending on sort of where you're at, you can imagine that there's, there's different levels. And so I'm going to focus in here on the state of Minnesota just for a second to, to make a couple of sort of statements about this. But what you can see if I focus in, so this is Minnesota. Um, you see up in the, the northern part, there are values that are quite low um, in sort of the central and in the southern part, the values tend to get quite high or some of these get even up as close to say 90%. And so the variation in these different um, concentrations here can be mostly attributed to the varying relationships that those subcomponents have with the different environmental factors. And so what we found in sort of in general is that low base flow values um, and high percentage of wetland areas tend to result in lower percentages of inorganic um, nitrogen in these particular lakes. And in particular, we saw that uh, low percentages of inorganic nitrogen when the lake to watershed ratio is high. And so when the lake is, represents a bigger part of the watershed, we're seeing low inorganic. Uh, the last to sort of tie back to that Lake Itasca that I mentioned earlier is that we see less um, inorganic nitrogen in isolated and headwater lakes in the lakes that have either an inland stream or those having lakes or streams feeding into them from upstream. And so then that sort of makes sense. We get um, presumably sort of cleaner and more organic nitrogen in locations that have, um, uh, that, are, that are isolated or are, are, do not have other streams feeding through them, especially as you start thinking as you get down into the more agricultural land. And so to, to, to assess our model, it was a purely built from an inferential perspective to try to tease out some of the relationships with the environment. But we did want to look at some of the, the ability of the model to do prediction. And so we did um, some cross-validation to assess our predictive performance for the model to see both the bias and uncertainty in our estimates. And so using 80% of the lakes to fit the model, we left the other 20% out to do as a validation set. Um, unfortunately, you can't really do formal um, in, in the traditional sense, formal uh, prediction assessment because there is no true value, right? So for even for a holdout location, we have something like seven measures of total nitrogen, and some of them might have been directly measured, and some of them might have been computed. So how do you really know what your predictive value is supposed to be? It's supposed to be somewhere in this range, presumably. And so we looked at this for more of an exploratory um, analysis or investigative procedure to try to see how well our model could predict performance. And so we uh, produced our prediction estimates for total nitrogen for these holdout, holdout uh, lakes by again predicting the subcomponents and then composition sampling to, sam to obtain estimates of total nitrogen. And so this is what the, the plot looks like if we have the median value of reported on the x-axis and the predicted value on the y-axis. Again, there's not sort of a, any sort of systematic bias in one direction or the other, and there doesn't really appear to be any sort of systematic bias between the methods of reporting 
Uh, what, what I can tell you is that 80% of the reported values of total nitrogen were captured by their predictive interval. 84% um, had all of their observations of total nitrogen contained by their predictive interval. And 92% captured one or more of the reported values. And so this is sort of our own assessment just to see, are we sort of on the right page? And, and we, we, we definitely think that we are. And so just a final comments here, and then I'll wrap up and take some questions. Uh, what this approach sort of benefited from was the fusion of our speciated nitrogen data across these different methods of reporting. We were able to incorporate replicate observations to try to capture what sort of variation there was in, in our um, ability to, to detect or to measure total nitrogen. We got different um, components for measurement error between the different uh, derived um, total nitrogen subspecies. We got detection limits that were incorporated, so we still were able to uh, leverage information that was from um, species that were that were that had low values in those particular lakes. And we got to be able to look at what the inference was with regard to the environmental covariates. So how are these different environment environmental covariates impacting these different subspecies? And so all of those were sort of important pieces to bring the model together and then to, to produce as inference for our team of collaborators who were very much interested in, in seeing how these results teased out. And for the most part, our environmental drivers <clears throat> impacted nitrogen in the way that they would have expected. Um, but seeing those differing effects for some of those variables was particularly um, important to, to some of our teammates. And so I mentioned just briefly this issue of time. And so we assume this is, I would say, the biggest uh, holdback from the, the model that we've currently been working with is that we assumed everything was constant in time. We, definitely know that that's not the case, right? Not only is there changes in the environment like climate, but there's changes in land use. Um, and so trying to incorporate those types of, of changes in the model is definitely a direction of future work. How we're thinking about this from sort of a model-based um, framework is quite challenging because the lack of sufficient data in order to inform these, these temporal gradients, for example. And so very, very, very few lakes in the region have lake nitrogen data that have um, sort of a, a long enough time series to, to be able to actually identify how those nutrient concentrations are changing. And so future model development does in fact look at, does in fact uh, focus on looking at that. We're going to have to focus on just really a few different um, lakes to try to study that. And so the hard part there is thinking about how can we still get lakes that are sort of spanning the environmental gradient to see how uh, these changes are, are different maybe across the spatial region. And so there's a lot of sort of moving parts here, but trying to come up with ways to incorporate that temporal variability is the sort of most obvious next direction for, for future development. And so I'll end there. Um, the, on the top here is the citation for this work. Uh, it should appear sort of any day, but you can easily get the, get the PDF um, if you are interested in finding it. So I think it's coming out in the next um, uh, publication of, of Annals of Applied Statistics. I got a couple of sort of uh, comments here, just about acknowledgments. And maybe the most important, again, is if you're interested in this uh, data set, please check out this, this, this website where you can find <clears throat> any number of the subcomponents or modules that make up this particular data set that I've used. And you can use it for your own research. You can use it in your teaching. I think probably the last six semesters of classes that I've taught, my students have analyzed some component of this data. So there's a lot of different components that you might be interested in looking at. And so I highly recommend you checking it out. And so I will stop there, um, maybe even unpause my screen, and feel free to jump out with questions. Thank you, Erin. That was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, does anyone have any question or comment for Erin? And maybe before that, I just want to quickly mention that uh, David has put in the chat a link, uh, and he also says that Erin is available uh, after the talk for an hour or so to meet with anyone. So if you would like to do so, you can click on the link and, and put your name uh, there. So thanks, thanks Erin, for that and taking the time to, to talk with yeah, everyone. Absolutely. Any, to any questions? Uh, I have a question. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Hi, Aaron. Uh, this is Andrew. Uh, great talk. Uh, thank you. Hey. Um, yeah.
<laughs> All right, thanks. Um, the yeah, one question, two questions actually. Uh, the first one was on on the data, the replicates. Are so assuming that these replicates are uh, conditionally independent, identically distributed, um, but they're taken, I guess, from different parts of the lake. Um, is there an implicit assumption that this lake is homogeneous, that the nitrates and the ammonia is evenly distributed uh, throughout the lake? And, and I think this is important because there's a question whether this, this uh, highly skewed distribution of errors that you're seeing, whether that is due to high scale variation of the of the chemicals within the lake or whether it's pure measurement error. Um, so that's the first question. And the second question was about um, spatial borrowing of strength. Uh, so yeah, I'm, the way I understood it, there's no explicit spatial modeling here. Um, I do, and, and yeah, from the, from the EDA you showed that that seems about right, but I'm wondering whether there's a case for um, making those coefficients um, spatially dependent, because I can imagine that there might be some environmental variables which might affect the chemical content of these lakes in a spatial way. Um, I wonder whether that was looked into. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, so from the first perspective, yes, you could definitely, I would definitely agree with you. Um, they do try, when they do their sampling, they do try to go to parts of the lake that are not just like little alcoves of the lake that maybe have much more stagnant water. And so they are trying to sort of alleviate that issue where you get these main pockets that have possibly a lot of nitrogen or a lot of phosphorus, a lot of chlorophyll versus other locations where the water is much more, um, more, more moving. Um, but you, you could definitely imagine that that could be in fact the case. So the issue with the measurement error itself, however, is that that component with the, with the auxiliary data was just from a tube of water. And so we didn't actually, uh, use sort of these extreme tails of the distribution um, in a case where multiple locations were sampled. And so it was that measurement error was was obtained from the 86 labs reporting a value for a particular measure. So it purely was measurement error in that particular setting. Oh, okay. But you're right that depending on where where you are in the lake, you could you could definitely get different concentrations. And that's something that we did not account for, just like we didn't account for the time component. Yeah. Okay. Um, your second comment uh, is definitely true. So we have in the model right now, the coefficients of those betas are only species specific and they're not actually varying across space. But there has been work in modeling using just, just a, sort of a purely uh, spatial coefficient model to investigate how they might vary across say a region or at least across say within a watershed. Um, but we did not build that into the model at this particular um, setting because we were focusing on the different subspecies. But you could imagine building this sort of spatially varying coefficient models for the different subspecies of nitrogen. And that is definitely plausible, but at some point you're gonna possibly run out of run out of computing power to do that. And so yeah, yeah. you could do that, you could borrow strength and try to, and try to understand that. But but right now we assumed that the environmental covariates themselves were what was driving the spatial variation. All right, thanks a lot, Aaron. Great. Yeah, Are there any other comments? Hi, Aaron. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, David here. Um, yeah, that was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I, this idea of having sort of three sort of subspecies of nitrogen that you're interested in and four types of observables that are linear combinations of them. I hadn't seen this idea before um, and I was just wondering if you can think of other contexts where it would be useful or if it's just a yeah. really specific thing to this problem. Yeah, so it's actually not. And so where I actually came up with this idea from the model is actually some work that I did as a, as a postdoc in a, con in a context with um, um air quality measurements and so there's actually so think about say pm 2.5 as a measure of particulate matter there's actually subspecies of particulate matter that have the same sort of um, components and so in some data sources you can see the total amount of pm 2.5 and then in other data sources depending on what the network is that's observing the air quality measures there's actually the subspecies of particulate matter as well and the challenge in that particular work, and I can send you a reference um, if you'd like, is that um, 
once again, you, you aren't ensured that your total PM 2.5 is greater than or equal to the sum of the components. And so trying to build that into a model to, to learn about PM 2.5 um, provided sort of the context and the challenge there. And so, I mean, so that's just another example. And again, it's an environmental example. Um, surely we could probably think hard enough and come up with a, another sort of place where this type of thing happens. But uh, it was definitely beyond what I knew about even when this project started. And I think it was beyond what any of my colleagues at the limnologist team were even thinking about either because they never sort of dug into the details. They just, here's your vector of TN, then go. Um, but once we sort of got them talking about this, it just sort of opened our eyes that there's a lot more going on here under the hood than, than anyone's sort of accounting for. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Well, thanks, Erin. Uh, I think we can uh, give you a round of applause for, for the great talk. So I'll do <laughs> Thank it. You. Um, yeah, and so I'll uh, stop the recording here. Um, and uh, yeah, anyone who wants to have a chat with Erin can uh, meet her um, online and then put uh, your name on the list where uh, David put the link. So thanks everyone. Thanks Erin for giving the talk um, and being uh, flexible with time as well. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, everyone says thanks in the chat. I think. Yeah, I see that. I see that. It's awesome. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.